Okay, so in this lecture, we will be looking at nominals. These are those words, phrases, and clauses that serve the function of a noun. So we've looked at adjectivals and adverbials and the many different forms that they can take. And nominals are pretty similar in that they can also take many different forms, but they're also much more fundamental to the parts of a sentence. As we can see here, nominals make up the majority of the necessary parts of a sentence, not just the subjects, but the objects, indirect objects, and complements as well. So you want to be very familiar with how nominals work since they are literally all over the place. Okay, first off is the nominal known as the apositive. It is a strange sounding word until you recognize that it is essentially the inverse of opposite or opposition, which means contrary to. So apposition or um, apositive is an opposition to opposition. In other words, it means it is parallel to instead of an opposition to. Thus, an apositive is a nominal that runs parallel to another nominal, one that redescribes or that identifies that other nominal. Make sense? So um, apositives are very useful and are commonly used. In fact, once you realize that they're there, you're gonna see them all over the place. So a few rules about them. Now, normally they will go between commas, but sometimes, especially if it's a proper name, it won't. So we look at this example. My dog, Bonnie, is a golden doodle puppy. Now, if I had more than one dog and I had to identify which one I'm talking about, I would write, my dog, Bonnie, is a golden doodle puppy. So you follow the same rules as restrictive versus non-restrictive uh, commas or clauses. If you need to identify which one you are referring to, if you need to restrict the noun, then you do not use commas. So another point about apositives, they should be able to completely replace the nominal that they are opposite to. You should be able to reverse their position and still have everything make sense. So we could say going for walks, her least favorite activity can be a bit of a hassle. Or we could say her least favorite activity, going for walks, can be a bit of a hassle. Now, this second one sounds a little bit more strange because we normally wouldn't write that way, but grammatically it still makes sense and it still has the exact same content. So that shows that these are um, apposites or apositives. And then finally, you can have a series of apositives, uh, but it's just a good idea to put those between dashes instead of commas so that we don't get overwhelmed by all the different commas. Taking care of a puppy, training them well, dealing with their nipping, keeping them healthy, can be a significant challenge for the kids. Okay. Um, actually, one thing I forgot to mention that um, I wanted to emphasize here is that notice that apositives have to have the same grammatical structure or form of what you are making it parallel to. So up here, we have a noun phrase, my dog, and we have another noun phrase, Bonnie. Um, here, we have a verb phrase, which we'll talk about later, I'm going for walks. And um, wait a minute, I'm sorry. <laughs> it says you had to have the exact same grammatical phrase, uh, but this one obviously does not. Uh, I would say it's a bit stylistically more elegant if you do. And the reason I was thinking about this is because taking care of a puppy follows training them well, dealing with their nipping, keeping them healthy. All those are verb phrases. Fits much better than going for walks for this favorite activity. But you can technically do this as well. So I think I... Um, thought in my head for a moment that you had to have the same grammatical form, but you obviously do not. So let's keep moving. And now, apositives can be set off with colons if what comes before it is a complete sentence. And you should also know that apositives, while they are technically nominals, can be apposite of an entire sentence too. So you can have uh, sentences like this, where you know we saw this one in the previous sentence, where we set off apositives with dashes, or we could just move all of that to the very end with a colon. Taking care of a puppy can be a significant challenge for kids. Colon, training them well, dealing with their nipping, keeping them healthy, where we could even make that whole a positive an entire sentence. Taking care of a puppy can be a significant challenge for kids, colon. You have to train them well, deal with their nipping, keep them healthy. You could have also, of course, put a semicolon here. The colon has a different sort of feel. It's a little bit more of a reveal that you want to emphasize. Um, but yes, these two sentences are in apposition to each other. They are a positives. The key is you have to have a complete sentence before the colon. All right, so here is a few examples, and this is from the group discussion. This is not an exercise, so you will not be doing this for your homework. But I just wanted to look at how they use a positives 
and they are um, asking you, actually, they're not using A positives. They are asking you to revise these uh, sentences so that they do have A positives to make them more elegant. Because one of the things that an A positive can do is it can help make your sentences more compact and efficient by adding extra details about the subject or direct object without having a whole separate sentence for that. So let me give you an example. The Lost Colony is an outdoor symphonic drama that tells the story of the British settlement on Roanoke Island. It has been performed in Manteo, North Carolina every summer since 1937. I like this verb phrase has been performed much better than is. So I'm going to revise this to make this whole part my A positive. And one of the ways you know you can make something an A positive is if you use the verb is, because that suggests you're talking about a complement, which means you could um, basically tuck that away into an A positive phrase. So the lost colony, comma, an outdoor symphonic drama that tells the story of the British settlement on Roanoke Island, comma, has been performed in Manteo, North Carolina every summer since 1937. That I think works better. I could even switch the order. I could say an outdoor symphonic drama that tells the story of the British settlement on Roanoke Island. The, actually, wait. I mean, I guess you could, and then you put commas between the lost colony has been performed, but this just sounds kind of weird. So I don't think you'd normally do that. Let's look at the next one. Alan B. Shepard was the first American to fly in space. He was launched on a 302 uh, mile suborbital shot over the Atlantic in 1961. I would probably write, Alan Shepard, the first American to fly in space, was launched on a da, 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 and so forth. Or I could say the first American to fly in space, comma, Alan Shepard, comma, was launched on a da, 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 and so forth. Finally, the Gateway Arch in St. Louis is the nation's tallest memorial. It commemorates the westward expansion of the United States. It was designed by architect Aero Renan. It is made of stainless steel and rises 630 feet high from its foundation. Okay, so there's a lot we could try to pack in here. Um, like I said before, one thing I like to do if I'm going to combine things is to find the best verb and to make that my primary verb. I like commemorates. So I'm gonna to try to fit everything else in around it. I would say the Gateway Arts in St. Louis, comma, the nation's tallest memorial, comma, commemorates, um, no, actually, I don't want to go into commemorates yet because I want to get, um, I got to get all this information about it before the commemorate. So I would say the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, comma, the nation's tallest memorial, comma, designed by architect Aero Serenian, um, comma, made of stainless steel. Um, could I say that? Made of stainless steel. No, that one wouldn't work because that's not an A positive. That's a problem. Um, I'm just going to skip the rest of it. You get the idea. All right. Um, a positive. So again, this time we're combining sentences, same sort of idea. Um, we can use any colons or dashes if we want these ones you will do. So I'll go over two and four. Many languages are spoken in the United States. The top four are English, Spanish, Chinese, and French. I can just drop off that last part, put a colon instead of a period and say many languages are spoken in the United States, English, Spanish, Chinese, and French. No, I got to keep the top four. So I would say the top four languages spoken in the United States. <laughs> no, because I need a better verb there. I would say, um, I guess I'd use a semicolon. Yeah. And just make it two separate sentences rather than try to make that an A positive sentence. I don't think it really works. Let's try this one. Um, and the big three at the Yalta Conference in 1945 were Franklin D. Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin. Franklin D. Roosevelt was the President of the United States. Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Joseph Stalin was the General Secretary. So here's pretty easy. I would say the big three at the Yalta Conference in 1945 were Franklin D. Roosevelt, comma, President of the United States, semicolon, Winston Churchill, comma, uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain, semicolon, and Joseph Stalin, comma, General Secretary of the Soviet Union, period, using those semicolons to separate complex lists. All right, I'm ready to be done with A positives. Let's move on. Gerunds and infin infinitives. So like adjectivals and adverbials, uh, verb phrases can also be nominals. And like adjectival and adverbial verb phrases, nominal verb phrases are not tensed. Um, with adverbials, we use the infinitive form. That is two plus the base form. 
Uh, they have an implied in order before them. And with adjectivals, we use the participial form, past or present, where we add an ed or an ing to them. That's just kind of get us up to speed, remind us. But with nominal verb forms, we use the gerund, which is essentially the present participle, the ing form, or we use the infinitive form, depending on the meaning or context that we want to give. But they are essentially uh, interchangeable. Now, the nominal verb phrase can be in any position. So just to give you an example, arriving late is my worst enemy. In this case, um, arriving late is the subject. And in this one, to arrive late is my worst enemy. It's also the subject. And that's just an example of how you use the gerund form here and the infinitive form here. Down here, I have it in the subject complement position. My favorite part of camping is building a campfire. So remember that the subject complement um, kind of puts an equal sign between the subject and its complement. So building a campfire is the favorite part of camping in being a uh, gerund. It can also be the object of a preposition. Um, after getting a new alarm clock, he stopped arriving late. After is a preposition. Getting a new alarm clock is a nominal verb phrase. And then in this case here, it is the direct object because what is he stopped doing? He stopped arriving late. Now, like adjectival and adverbial verb phrases, nominal verb phrases often have an implied subject or agent. So you'll want to make sure that you are matching the implied subject with the actual subject. Um, otherwise, again, you're liable to create a brief moment of incomprehension or confusion in the reader. That's part of what we're trying to avoid with good effective writing. Um, so let's look at a couple of examples. They want us to underline the gerunds and infinitives in the following sentences, identify the function of each nominal verb phrase. You might want to refer to sentence patterns too to refresh your memory. By remaining silent, he was actually making the situation worse. So we see my gerund here. Um, I have a preposition here. So this is a prepositional object is where I have this gerund. And then over here, he was actually making the situation worse. You might think this is a gerund but it is not, it is the present progressive form. Um, he was making, that's, well, I guess um, the past progressive form. Um, what is he making? He's making the situation worse. So the situation is a noun phrase and that's the direct object. Worse is an adverb. Uh, Ms. Graham chose to welcome the new investor into the company. Um, this too might be a signal that we have an infinitive. And in fact it is because it's followed immediately with the infinitive form. So what did Ms. Graham choose? Um, she chose to welcome the new investor into the company. So that is our direct object. That's the position it is plain. Uh, number six, raising the company's national profile was the new owner's long-term goal. Raising is a gerund. Here it's functioning as the subject. Raising the company's national profile is that subject. And here's our first tense verb. Number eight, the baby's crying upset the rest of the passengers. Crying is a noun. Um, it's functioning as a noun here. It's the head word of um, this noun phrase, and it's functioning as the subject. The baby's crying. What did it do? It upset who? The rest of the passengers. Okay. All right. Finally, the nominal clause. Uh, this one's really significant and maybe a bit tricky to get our heads around. Um, the nominal clause is a dependent clause, of course, that plays a part of a noun. And like adverbial and adjectival clauses, nominal clauses start with a word that makes it a dependent clause. And we call this a nominalizer. Great word, I know. Um, it, it is usually the word that, or it could be some interrogative, um, something like where, wherever, when, whenever, who, whoever, whom, who, uh, whomever, and so forth. You will often find that the direct object of sentences is a nominal clause. In fact, some verbs will almost always be followed by one, such as said or knew or argued. So for instance, he said, nominal clause, I'm glad to see you. Now in this case, it is an entire independent clause, but it's still functioning as the direct object of said. Um, he said that he was glad to see me. This is the more typical 
um, nominalized form with the nominalizer that. He heard that we were on our way. Again, that is the nominalizer, and then everything else is the nominal clause. And he knew that coming over was a bad idea. Notice how you have within the nominal clause a nominal verb phrase uh, serving as the subject coming over. Now, nominal clauses will also play the part of the subject, like this example. Why we had to pay for dinner when they were the ones who invited us is not clear. So why is an interrogative that can start a nominal clause, and this whole bolded part is nominal. Nominal clauses are often, very, uh, often used to, um, as a delayed subject. Well, this is with sentences that begin with, it is. And sometimes it is a pronoun and it's referring to something specific. But as we talked about before, sometimes it's simply a dummy subject. It's a placeholder that's not actually the sentence's subject, but it's just there because we need some noun phrase before the predicate. So for example, it is not clear why we had to pay for dinner when they invited us. Um, what I've done here is I've moved my subject to the end of my sentence and I have to put in a dummy subject there to put something before the verb. So I say, it is not clear, and not clear is still my subject complement, but now it's dummy subject, verb, subject complement, and then subject. Um, same thing goes for any other type of nominal. It is natural to feel angry at such treatment. So it is the dummy subject, Natural is the subject complement, and then to feel angry at such treatment. This is a nominal verb phrase. We're using the infinitive to feel, and it still has the same sort of effect. It's the subject that's been pushed to the end. And this stylistically is really helpful if you want to highlight what is essentially the subject. It makes um, sentences with the verb is a little bit more um, engaging because it kind of glosses over the is pretty quickly and it gets you to the important part. All right, so let's look at a few examples. They want us to underline the nominal clauses and then identify what function they are serving. So we'll do the odd numbers. With binocular vision, our ancestors knew when they should take refuge in trees. Um, yeah. When they should take refuge in trees is what they knew. So when is our nominalizer here? And all this is the nominal phrase. It's the direct object of new. For do you know why the hawks, the eyes of hawks evolved to function like telescopes? No is my verb. And why the eyes of hawks evolved to function like telescopes is the nominal clause that is the direct object or complement of the verb no. Finally, when biologists wondered whether human hummingbirds can see ultraviolet light, they studied the flowers these birds frequent. Now we have to be mindful here because we have this comma and that indicates that this is a dependent clause, but a dependent clause could have a nominal clause as one of its parts. So let's um, dig into it a little bit more. When biologists wondered whether hummingbirds can see ultraviolet light. Okay, so when is my um, subordinate adverb, is that what I call it? Oh, I'm almost forgetting the name. Anyways, it's starting the adverbial clause. Uh, biologist is my subject, wondered is the verb, what did they wonder? And this is my nominal clause, whether hummingbirds can see ultraviolet light. That's where the nominal clause is, but all that is not part of the independent clause. That is part of the dependent clause. And the subject of the independent clause is they studied, and the object is the flowers. Um, actually, we have here missing a that. And one thing you should remember that I guess I forgot to mention is that with nominal clauses, you will often drop the that so it will just be implied. So we actually have another nominal clause no, no, excuse me, not a nominal clause. We don't have a nominal clause here. We have a relative clause here, a, um, um, an adjectival clause. So um, the nominal clause is whether hummingbirds can see ultraviolet light. They studied the flowers is another clause. Which flowers did they 
study, they studied the ones that these birds frequent. So the that for the relative adjectival clause has been dropped. Phew, I almost you know, messed up that one. All right, so those are the nominal clauses. Those are nominals. Um, again, we'll be practicing this in class, so we will come back and talk about it then.